الإسلام ديني ومحمدا رسول الله ويقيني أدنو إليه ساجدا بجبيني اقبل صلاة السلام عليكم ورحمة الله تعالى وبركاته الحمد لله رب العالمين صلى الله وسلم وبارك على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرة ما ما بعد وأنا أولكم you all to Valley Ranch Islamic Center for this very special presentation on the subject of سحر جن and the cure which is رقية the recitation of the Quran for the purpose of healing إن شاء الله تبارك وتعالى may Allah سبحانه وتعالى protect your household يا رب العالمين protect you and your families يا رب العالمين the subject of sihr is a serious, serious subject and serious matter that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala spoke about in the Quran. In the ayat we listened from Shaykh Yas as we were reciting surat, from Surah Al-Baqarah and Salat Al-Isha, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, يُعَلِّمُونَ النَّاسَ السِّحْرِ Speaking about the story of Harut or Marut, that they teach people as sihr which means magic. So it is a skill that is taught and have been taught from generation to generation to generation and people use that unfortunately in most of cases with ill feelings or maybe targeting people for the, for the purpose of harming them. Some people, unfortunately, they use that and they're very naive. They use sihr with the good intentions, but the damage is always, Allah musta'an, uh, uh, serious. In, in our tradition as Muslims, sihr is considered one of the major sins, al-kaba'ir, uh, to practice that and to even uh, cause any harm to any individual when it comes to the subject of sihr. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, as the Prophet says, he did, not, he did not allow any sickness or illness to, to happen without providing cure for it, which is a ruqya and the healing, inshallah, wa ta'ala. So tonight, bidin Allah, we're going to start talking about this issue. And why around that time? Because uh, uh, Halloween is around the corner, Jama'ah. Uh, and subhanAllah, as we were driving uh, uh, to the masjid, even though it's raining outside, may Allah make this a rain of rahmah, ya Rabbil Alameen. As I was coming here, I saw some people already actually in, in the fun for, uh, uh, for Halloween. They're outside, outdoors, big fire, costumes, Allahu Alam what they're doing. And I'm just saying, A'udhu Billah Mishaita Rajeem. My daughter and I started deciding, Sulqulhu Allahu Ahad, Qulhu Adhu Rabbi Falak, Qulhu Adhu Rabbi Nas. People purposely or otherwise might be invoking yani jinn or, or, or causing damage to themselves or other people. So inshallah ta'ala, tonight we're going to learn more about this to protect ourselves, our families. So the first, our first speaker inshallah is Sheikh Yasser Qadi, is one of our famous, alhamdulillah, Rabbi Amin, uh, nationally and internationally uh, scholars. Uh, Sheikh Yasser, I've known him for so many years, mashallah, as a former colleague for Al-Maghrib Institute, and now he is... Medina. Uh, Medina, Sheikh, I mean, come on. Medina, you were still studying Arabic language when I was there. <laughs> Alhamdulillah, from the early colleagues in Medina universities when I first met him many, many years back, mashallah, now 1995. Uh, and then, alhamdulillah, we joined together as uh, uh, colleagues through Al Maghrib uh, Institute, a beautiful journey we had together, mashallah, alhamdulillah, until he decided to, barakallah, to uh, venture into moving forward to benefit the Muslim community at a higher level with establishing the, uh, the Islamic Seminary of America, as he's one of the founders and the dean, alhamdulillah, Rabbi Amin, there. So, Sheikh Hassel Qadi has a uh, I don't know how many people know that. Uh, I hope you all know because you're residents in this area. He's one of the latest addition to the Muslim community in the DFW. He's alhamdulillah also the resident scholar as well in uh, Epic Masjid, our neighboring city as well. So without uh, further ado, Shaykh Yasir Khan, Zakallah. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillah rabbil alameen. Wa salatu wa salamu ala Sayyidina Muhammadin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Amma ba'd. The topic of jinn and sihr always brings about a lot of attention, a lot of tales, a lot of anecdotes. It is the topic of conversation since we have been teenagers. And it is something that is actually universal in every single culture on earth. Every culture in the world believes in demons and in otherworldly beings. This is a universal global phenomenon. And the, our Quran and Sunnah tells us very many things about this world. The information that we have about this world of jinn and shayateen and demons, it comes from two sources. The first of them is what Allah and His Messenger have said, and this is ilm yaqini. This is factual. This is something that we take as theology. And the second is the experiences of men, the collective experiences of mankind with this world. And those experiences, we can benefit from them as long as we look at the Quran and Sunnah and through the lens of the Quran and Sunnah. So 
much benefit can be derived by looking at the cumulative experiences of mankind with this world. Okay, Bismillah. Is there a car parked incorrectly? No, oh, okay. uh, just a interruption because they have a lot, lot of kids actually running in the hallways. Okay. And uh, we do have a free babysitting. The whole multi-purpose whole room actually is open there, alhamdulillah. We have actually brought, mashallah, professional babysitters there for families so they can put their kids there. Please make sure kids are in the babysitter uh, sitting room. Again, it's free service for you, for, for the children, inshallah. That's Zakmallah khair. So, as I was saying, we are allowed to benefit from the cumulative experiences of mankind dealing with this world. And from that, we can posit various theories, various understandings. And in today's lecture, I will intertwine the two. But when it is something derived from the Quran and Sunnah, I'll tell you, because that is yaqini. And when it is something that is from ijtihadat of experiences of men, I'll say this is vanni. It's something that is not certain and Allah Azza wa Jal knows best. So, I only have 23 minutes and 15 seconds and counting. And this topic is one that actually I and many have given detailed classes on for many, many hours. So we have to summarize very, very quickly. The fact of the matter, dear Muslims, if we understand the reality of jinn, we will understand the reality of sihr. It's as simple as that. If you know the characteristics of the jinn, you will understand what sihr is. And insha'Allah, you will not fear it. We should never fear anything other than Allah. Unfortunately, there's a lot of mythology and folklore. Unfortunately, people's imans, they don't have their ilm. And so their iman is shaken. They don't know what to do. And they have a sense of fear that is not good. We should fear only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the more knowledge we have, the more we understand that sihr is a phenomenon that is easily understood. Like we might be scared of a thief, we might be scared of a, a, an animal that might attack us. Similarly, it's okay to have a natural fear of sihr. But there's no need to have any supernatural fear. Once you understand the reality of the jinn, everything falls into place. So, let us quickly go over four or five characteristics of the jinn. Then I will talk about sihr and you will see how easily they fit together. First and foremost, the jinn as we know are another creation of Allah. They were created before Adam. Adam, and they were created from what is the Quranic term? What were they created from? Smokeless fire. Our young brother tells us the answer. Smokeless fire, right? Now, pause here. Footnote. This is the tajriba of men, the experiences of men. This is an ijtihad now that I have and I've said this publicly and I could be right and I could be wrong. Allah knows best, but it appears that the jinn, therefore, are what we would call in our modern vernacular a type of energy i.e. they exist on the energy spectrum. That's what I mean. They are real. I'm not denying their existence. But they're not physical bodies of flesh and blood. They don't exist in the three dimensions that we have. They exist in the world that physicists called the spectrum of energy. And this also explains why in the common cumulative experiences of men, when these paranormal psychics try to investigate, they try to monitor electromagnetic activity. And typically, electromagnetic activity goes up and down when these entities are there. So, smokeless fire. What is fire? Fire is a type of energy, right? Smokeless fire. It is not it is not perceptible. So this is the, the Qur'an along with the cumulative ishtihad of men as I have put it together. Now, therefore, the second point, if they're made from smokeless fire, their existence is not something that our physical senses can detect. They are beyond the spectrum of red, orange, yellow, blue, indigo, violet, the Roy spectrum. They're beyond that. They exist, but our eyes cannot see them. Their energy spectrum is beyond the spectrum. They're either ultraviolet, infrared, one of those areas. We cannot see them beyond our spectrum. And that's why Allah says in the Quran, إِنَّهُ يَرَاكُمْ هُوَ وَقَبِيلُهُ مِنْ حَيْثُ لَا تَرَوْنَهُمْ He can see you from a place you cannot see them. He and his tribe can look at you. They can witness us. They can interact with our dunya. But we cannot interact with their dunya. We are not created that way. They can flip in and out between our dimension and theirs. No problem. We are 3D bodies made of flesh and blood. We cannot just flip into their dimension and come back in. They can do it to us. Number three. The, the fact that they're created from energy. This is again ijtihadi. But the Quran proves one point. That they have speed. They can go super fast. And of course, if they're created from energy, then they're going to go as fast as? Lights. Lights. 
And that's something that makes a lot of sense. If you look at it again, this is ishtihad, as fast as my opinion. Uh, uh, the Quran or the Sunnah tells us they go super fast, right? The point is that uh, we learn from the Quran and Sunnah that they can go super fast. They can go at speeds that are khayali for us, imaginary for us, something that we could not even imagine. No supersonic jet can go as fast as these entities can go. And if they are created from energy, well, then it makes complete sense to us. So we learn this from the story of Sulaiman and the Queen of Sheba, where when Sulaiman says, who is going to bring me the, the throne, right? And where was Sulaiman when he asked this? Where was he? Aqsa, Palestine, right? And where was the throne? In Yemen, right? Qala ifritum min al jinni. Ana atika bihi. What was the time frame? Qabla an taquma min maqamik. Before you stand up, one millisecond, the jinn is going to able to go all the way from Palestine to Yemen and then bring it back from Yemen to Palestine, right? That is supersonic speed. That is the speed of light. So the jinn is saying, I'm able to do that. This leads us to our next point. The jinn can also therefore physically lift objects that are more powerful than the average human can lift, right? So the jinn or at least the ifrit of the jinn, because the jinn are different levels, and ifrit is the worst amongst them. Christians call them the demons of the, of the spiritual world. So this is the worst of the jinn. The ifrit are the worst, and the ifrit are the strongest, and the meanest, and the most evil. So the ifrit of the jinn said, single-handedly, the throne is going to be as big as this mimbar of mihrab. They're going to take that entire throne, and he will single-handedly transport it from Yemen all the way to the uh, place of Sulaiman Ali Salman Aqsa, and this shows us that perhaps we can say the average jinn is physically stronger than the average human. They're not infinitely strong. They cannot lift the world or a mountain, but they're physically stronger. They have more power, just like a bodybuilder is stronger than a non-bodybuilder. Just like the average male is stronger than the average female. This is the way Allah created. So too the average jinn and especially the average ifrit is physically stronger, but not infinitely strong. Only Allah Azza wa Jal is Al-Qawi. Also from this we learn something very, very interesting. Einstein was correct. Well. Not in necessarily e equals mc squared, but Einstein was correct in that matter and energy can be interchanged. We learned this from the story of Sulaiman. When the Ifrit said, I'll bring you the throne. This shows us that some, at least amongst the jinn, some amongst them, can take a physical object and transform it into energy and beam me up Scotty type of Analogy for those who know what I'm talking about. Dead stairs, great being back, okay. You can laugh after the lecture finishes. When Dr. Jonathan Brown came last week, every single movie reference he gave, dead silence. Afterwards, everybody texted him, oh, we all watched, but we didn't want to say in the masjid. Good, alhamdulillah, that's great. <laughs> he told me this, by the way, was like, okay, alhamdulillah. Uh, the point being that uh, when the Ifrit said, I'll bring, you the, I'll bring you the chair, right? And we learned this from human experience as well. We learn this from human experience, the cumulative human experience. They can take objects and they can bring them through walls. They can transport and just make it appear in front of you and you have no idea where it came from. You did not see it. The Ifrit would not pick up this chair and have it flying a thousand miles in the middle of the air. No, it would disappear over there and reappear in front of Suleiman. And this is something that modern science proves the concept is possible. E equals mc squared. The concept of interchanging matter with energy, the general and specific theories of relativity, as you should be aware of those who do physics. So the point is that Allah has blessed the jinn with this physical capability. It's not supernatural. It's not magic. The jinn have powers that are natural for them and their world. Totally natural. Nothing supernatural. It is supernatural for our paradigm. We cannot see it, but it is completely natural for them. Now along with all of these physical characteristics, and there is more but I have to move on, they have one major psychological characteristic that we should be aware of. Okay? These are the physical characteristics. Along with this, they have one major psychological characteristic that our modern psychologists have diagnosed and talked about for many, many decades since the time of Freud. We all know this complex. It is called an inferiority complex. And the jinn suffer from a severe case of inferiority complex. How do we know this? From the story of Adam alayhi salam. 
right? Who is Adam? I'm supposed to be the one. You see this entity, the one that you chose over me, right? So Iblis and his Qareen, Iblis and his tribes, they suffer from severe inferiority complex, okay? They felt deprived of a right that they felt they should have had. So combine all of this together and then look at people who take advantage of this psychological and physical framework of the jinn. Sihr is the intersection of the world of men, the intentional intersection, the intentional intersection of the world of men with the world of the jinn. And what the sahir does is the sahir takes advantage of the physical capabilities of the jinn. The jinn can travel supersonic speed. The jinn cannot be seen by our eyes, right? The jinn can lift powerful objects. The jinn can do things, you know, physically from its perspective, but from our perspective, we cannot see. The jinn can cause physical harm in its paradigm. We cannot see where that harm came from. The scratches, this and that, what is happening here? Or pains or suffering or whatnot. The jinn can do it in its paradigm as a physical manifestation of its energy powers. Whereas from our paradigm, we're like, what is happening? I don't see it. I cannot see it. But from the jinn, it is something physical. So the jinn is able to do whatever the tricks the magician wants it to do, right? So all that sihr is, is the jinn being an evil jinn. It's all that it is. Whether it is causing problems between a man and a wife by waswasa, by physical barrier, whether it is having miscarriages by literally entering the uterus of the woman and, and literally doing something to the fetus and causing a miscarriage. For the jinn, it is the physical world that it is in. It can do that. Nothing supernatural. The jinn is not just saying, Audhu billah kun fayakun. Only Allah can say that. The jinn has physical capabilities to do what it does. Allah has given it those capabilities. If the jinn uses them for evil, it will have to answer to Allah for that evil. So the, ma the magician, the sahir, will say to the jinn, Go and irritate that couple. Go and cause that business to go bankrupt. So the jinn will go anytime somebody wants to come into the shop, they might feel something pushing. They might see some apparition. They might get a waswasa. Ah, don't go here. So from the jinn, it's physical. And in our side, we can't really see what's going on, so we assume it is supernatural. And perhaps it is from our paradigm. But from the jinn's paradigm, it is totally natural. The jinn is not doing something that is beyond the capabilities that Allah has given. So this is what sihr is. Now, why would the jinn do this for the sahir? And this is where we get to the biggest misconception that exists about sihr amongst the Muslim masses, and even amongst some non many non-Muslims. The misconception is that the sahir, the magician, controls the jinn. This is the misconception. The misconception is that the, the, the magician has somehow, has somehow taken over and has command of the jinn. So the boss is the magician and the jinn are the servants of the magician. This is the biggest lie and the biggest fraud that needs to be completely eradicated from our minds. There's only one person that had control over the jinn by the permission of Allah. Who was that? Sulaiman. Our Prophet wasallam could have had that power. But he said, out of respect to my brother Sulaiman, I gave it up. He could have had that power. Allah only gave one person this is Allah Azza wa Jal who gave this, right? So this is Allah that made Tasheer, not any other entity. No human being can control the jinn, except if Allah wills, and that was Sulaiman. I ask you by Allah, O Muslims, how will a human control the jinn? By whips? By chains? By what? How will a human control a jinn? This is the biggest fallacy and myth. Completely eradicate it. No, the, the human does not control the jinn. Quite the contrary. If there is a power dynamics and differential, it is the exact opposite. The jinn are controlling the human. What can the jinn obtain from this man? Or what can the magician give to the jinn? You tell me. Will the jinn take money? Does it take credit card in American Express? 
Will the PayPal transfer work for the jinn? You tell me, what does the jinn want from man? Kufr and shirk is correct, but there's more than this. Go back to my psychological issue. Inferiority complex. What does the jinn want from man then? Respect, obedience, ta'a, ibadah. The ultimate ta'a is ibadah. Ibadah is humility, servitude. Servitude with humility. The jinn, and of course you get a double whammy. You get buy one, get one free. By worshipping the jinn, the man also does what? Kufr and shirk. So buy one, get one free. This is what the jinn wants. The jinn wants that psychological inferiority complex to go. And that inferiority complex is that I am better than man, right? So the jinn wants the man to, sub, to basically show subservience to him or to it. So in reality, it is the jinn that has the power dynamics over the man. And now how does servitude shown? The jinn, now another point I did not mention, and I'm not saying this to, to bring about giggles or laughs, it is a factual thing, so please understand me. The jinn intellectually are far, far more deficient than man. They are not as intelligent as men. Now this is Allah's qadr that He has given. It's not as if we are the smartest of the creation. There are others probably more intelligent than us. We are not claiming that. But in the grand hierarchy of this dunya, of our given world, we are at the top of the pyramid of the intellect. Okay, of this dunya. Allah knows other creation and whatnot. But of this dunya that we see, we are the, at the top of the chain of the intellect. The jinn are intellectually very, very, we would say childish almost. They don't have that level of aql, that level of tadabbur and tafahum that we do. So, given this, what does the jinn want from ibadah for the man? What does the jinn want? What, what is the ibadah that the man can do? Now we enter the realm of spells and what the jinn will require. And uh, our brother is going to talk a little bit about that. But you know the common folklore. So again, the cumulative experience of men with jinn, right? All of you have read and seen movies and, and even even to the level of cartoons, what is in a magic spell? Give me some examples. What does a magician do according to the cartoons of Disney even? Huh? Chanting, what else? Magic wand, okay, what else? What does it give? What does it show? What is it what is it what items does it have? Give me some examples. Huh? Sacrificing things. Very good. Animal pieces, very good. Where do these things typically occur? Graveyards, right? Places that people don't go to, okay? Collect the eye of a frog and the leg of a toad and these ridiculous things. There's an element of truth. See, that's what I'm saying. The cumulative experience of men, it trickles down to folklore, right? It trickles down to these horror movies and these cartoons and these even, you know, the, 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 the genre of books and whatnot. Halloween as well. It trickles down like this Halloween thing, the same thing. So the point being that what does the jinn want ibadah? How is that ibadah shown? Look at these spells. Go find the eye of a frog and the leg of a newt and the this and that. Can you imagine an intelligent, sane, rational man at 3 a.m. going, walking outside, looking for a frog to pluck an eye out? Audhu billah, right? This is ibadah right here. When Allah commands us ibadah, He commands us with noble ibadah. Face the qibla, pray two rak'at, do tawaf seven times, go for hajj. These are noble actions. Sami'na wa ata'na. We hear and we obey. When shaitan commands ibadah, it is utter sacrilege and kufr and makes no sense whatsoever. At 3 a.m., go to the cemetery, walk here, do that, sacrifice this animal, take a black chicken and do this and rub blood and all of this filth and kufr. As well, there's a lot of sacrilegious stuff involved that I'm not going to say because of ihtiram and lakum, but just imagine the most disgusting, despicable, vile things you can and then realize sihr is worse than that. Realize sihr is worse than that. So the jinn wants to see the man humiliate itself, himself. And in this dynamics, it is the man that is the slave, the abd of the jinn. So the man will do these tricks and these ibadat, quote unquote, and that's why, according to the majority position, every sahir is a kafir and mushrik.
This is the majority position, and inshallah ta'ala it is the correct one. Uh, even though maybe, anyway, let's not talk about advanced stuff. But okay, for now, all sihr is shirk and kufr. Let's just keep it as a principle. There is an ikhtilaf. Put a footnote, there's an ikhtilaf. Uh, so, why is it sihr and kufr? To teach sihr is kufr. How about to practice sihr? Allah is saying in the Quran. To teach sihr is kufr. How about practicing sihr? So, to summarize therefore, sihr, I forgot to mention what it means. It means something that happens khufiyatan or without understanding how. Sihr is that which is hidden. Sihr is that which is hidden. So, sihr is the intersection of the world of men and jinn, the intentional intersection, not the accidental. That's another topic. The intentional intersection, where one of the evil men, and who taught them this? Harut and Marut, Allah Azza wa Jalla sent them as a test. The origin of this knowledge, Allah tested mankind with, right? So Allah tested mankind, this is how you call out to the jinn. And Maharut and Marut told them, do not do this. Whoever does it, it is kufr. From that, in Babylon, 5,000 years ago, from that, Sihr was born. And the Sahara continued expanding on these techniques and tactics, so much so that now there are different schools of sihr, different madhahib of sihr, different ways of calling out to the jinn. And it's not just one anymore. There's voodoo dolls, there's incantations, there's doing this and that, there's chants and charms. And there are many types of sihr. Very quickly, the lowest level of sihr is illusions. Saharu a'yun nas You see something that's not true. And this is sihr that is done. The sihr makes you think something is moving and it's not moving. Higher than this, that Allah mentions the breaking of a marriage. So evil thoughts come, thoughts that don't make any sense. Higher than this is that summoning a jinn to attack or to take over or to possess somebody. To summon a jinn and to send the jinn out. Again, again you pay the jinn in your ibadah and the jinn will do this uh, for you. And one type of sihr as well is that the jinn will get information for you. Past, present or future. Future is through the angels as you know the famous hadith of listening to the angels. As for past and present, it's straightforward. Present is a piece of cake. The jinn can go to the other side of the world and come back in a millisecond. So you can ask the jinn, what is happening in Timbuktu? And the jinn will come and tell you immediately right now. And so the sahir will say, I am telling you what is happening in Timbuktu. There's nothing miraculous at all. As for past, the jinns have longer lives than men. And so the jinns maybe will see where treasure has been married, buried 200 years ago. And so they will tell the magician, if they pay the magician in ibadah, they will tell the magician, treasure is buried over there, we were there when that man buried it. So this is past information, nothing quote-unquote magical. The jinn has seen, the jinn knows it because of its characteristics, and it will then tell the magician uh, this. The final point I have to finish up, inshallah ta'ala, how does one detect sihr? And I know our stad is going to go in this more detail. I want to mention one very important disclaimer. And I have dabbled in ruqya and exorcisms, but please, I don't do ruqyas, don't come to me. I have stopped doing them for many years. No, you have the brother here, go to him. I have stopped doing them for many, many reasons. But I have dabbled and I have my experiences and fair share. From my experiences, the default when a problem is happening in your family or situation or marriage, it has nothing to do with the jinn and everything to do with something in your own marriage. <laughs> okay? Stop blaming the jinn for everything. <laughs> Bichara miskin is sometimes innocent. <laughs> maybe if you have a temper, maybe the temper is the cause of the marriage problem and not the jinn. Okay? Or not sihar, I should say. In my humble experience, and I know without even talking to the Ustad that he's going to confirm this, the bulk of people who think they have sihar they don't have sihr. Do you agree with this? The bulk of people who think that they have sihr do not have sihr. It's your imagination that you think you have sihr. You need to get this out of your mind. The default, if your business is failing, you have a restaurant, it's not working, change the cuisine. Maybe you don't know how to cook very well. Okay? <laughs> Don't just blame Maybe your your mitari mirchi need to be changed, something like that, okay? Figure something else out. Stop blaming sihr for every problem. You didn't pass the MCAT, maybe you didn't study hard enough, you know, it's like that. So be realistic. Do not resort to blaming sihr unless and until 
clear symptoms appear. And these symptoms are very, very clear, unambiguous. When they appear, you know them, ilm al yaqeen that sihr has happened. It's not ambiguous that I don't know is it sihr or not. Very clear. And I'm going to mention this, then pass over to our ustad. Of them is that supernatural occurrences. Like if you see an entity that is a jinn, or you hear knocking, or you hear voices, or you hear somebody, if you see somebody flying in the air, then you can kind of eliminate a lot of things and say there's a jinn involved, okay? So, I mean, you can, supernatural, uh, supernatural occurrences. Of them, vivid dreams of a nature that anybody who knows, knows. I don't want to be explicit because I don't want to put it in your own imagination. Then you're going to say these dreams and then you have no. Go to any raqi with any experience. If you're having strange, bizarre dreams and within 10 seconds of telling the dream, I know whether this is sihr or not. It's very clear. Dreams are one of the signs of sihr. Another sign of sihr is... Uh, a supernatural reaction to the Quran and un, not a supernatural unnatural reaction to Quran unnatural reaction when the ruqya is done and there's an unnatural reaction frothing or laughing or crying or fainting something bizarre that shouldn't happen when the Quran is recited this is another thing and then the most difficult symptom is inexplicable symptoms symptoms that the doctors are scratching their head I, right I don't know why this is happening if you go to the doctor over over and over again for something that doesn't nobody understands carefully listen to me this is a very explicit point if the doctor can diagnose a problem if it is a disease that is well known if it's cancer this is not sihr sihr by definition the meaning of sihr is is beyond our spectrum it's unknown if the doctor diagnoses oh this is cancer that's not from sihr the shaitan doesn't create cancer this is a natural disease and you deal with it in a natural way sihr a simple example, constant miscarriages, and the doctor scratching his head like, I don't understand, she's healthy, you're healthy, everything seems to be working. For some inexplicable reason, by the fifth, sixth, seventh week, there's a miscarriage. I don't know why. Every test is coming out correct. Now we start thinking, maybe it is sihr, right? If the doctor can diagnose, oh, her hormone, or this, or that. If the doctor can diagnose, this is not sihr. Because by definition, sihr is beyond the spectrum, right? So inexplicable symptoms that are beyond the, uh, the, the spectrum of diagnosing diseases. And of course, much more can be said, but time is of the essence. I hope it does, inshallah, benefit. And with this, I pass it over to our dear brother. Jazakumullah khair. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Jazakumullah khair. Jazakumullah khair, Sheikh Yasser, for this beautiful presentation about the meaning of sihr and its connection with the jinn. And I can uh, really uh, attest to his uh, disclaimer that he mentioned regarding the subject of marriage, you know, business, uh, exams, and sihr and jinn and so on. I do a lot of marriage counseling, so one of the main things when people contact me, the first thing they ask for is, could you please do ruqya for us? Like immediately, the first thing they think about is that, you know, I'll be very explicit, they say, the first thing they think about is the mother-in-law, she did sihr on the, on the, on the daughter-in-law, right away. And you're going to have to eliminate that first. We're going to have to look into this first. It doesn't have to be sihr or jinn or anything like that. If you don't have the symptoms, like Sheikh mentioned, and inshallah ta'ala, brother uh, Abu Zaid is going to uh, elaborate on that more, bidnillahi azza wa jal. Uh, the other thing, if I ask, if I might ask the brothers actually who are sitting out there, if you guys can move here, there's enough space in the front here, in, in the back here, inshallah ta'ala. There's more space, so you don't have to block that, the exit, inshallah. So give them some space, move forward, Zakumullah khair, so, so we can allow them to get inside, inshallah ta'baraka wa ta'ala. Uh, alhamdulillah, coming now to the second uh, part of our presentation, uh, the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam says in the Hadith, "Ma anzal Allah tabaraka wa taala min da'an illa wa anzal ma'ahu dawa, alimahu man alimahu wa jahilu man jahila." No disease, no illness, nothing that was sent on earth over here as a mean of test for Ummah, but Allah subhanahu wa taala has also sent the antidote. He has sent a cure with it. Alimahu man alimahu wa jahilu man jahila. Some would know, some wouldn't know. So something like dealing with sihr and jinn and mess and so on requires obviously those who are expert in the field, those who have the, the proper knowledge for it in order for them to identify and also cure bin Allahi tabaraka wa ta'ala. And the cure is mentioned in the Quran and the Sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. One of the uh, very obvious for us to see it in the Quran is in Surah Qul la'udhu rabbil falaq and Qul la'udhu rabbil nas. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is asking us to seek refuge and protection with him from min sharr naffathati fil uqad and from the from uh, the evil of those the 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 the, the witches and, and the sorcerers who blow into the uqad means the knots basically they create the spells and blow the knots and them and so on so when it comes to making a sihr it has its own way 
And it's also breaking that sihr has its also its own way. Some people try to break the sihr in a wrong way, in a haram way, and others they do it in the proper way. So how can we learn about the, the spells that people you know practice and use? What are the signs for it? And how we can protect ourselves and cure ourselves from that, inshallah ta'ala. We have here Brother Abu Zaid Talha Hashmi. Originally, actually, as a matter of fact, he is in the senior management for Cisco, mashallah, in the IT field. Yani. But he does this, alhamdulillah, as a passion to help on, uh, the Muslim community in regards to the subject of ruqya and, uh, and healing. He is a, a student of one of the internationally renowned Muslim scholars who are specialized in the field, and that is uh, Sheikh Khalid al Habashi. So uh, uh, he's been, alhamdulillah, practicing this in the United States, also in Canada, and, and honestly, every time someone comes to me for this, I send them to them. So he's the one who's, mashallah, is dealing with all the cases that people might be asking about. So may Allah make it easy for him, Ya Rabbil Alameen, and reward him for helping out the community. Zakallah khair. Bismillah wa rahmatullah wa salatu wa salam ala rasulillah. So there's one more sickness that I want to add to, before we begin, inshallah, is uh, Ignorance itself is a sickness, what I found out uh, during the practice of ruqya. And attaining knowledge is definitely the cure. Uh, Bismillah. So, um, inshallah, I have 20, 20, 25 minutes. 25 minutes, inshallah. And uh, by the end of this, what I would like to see is uh, everybody here knows how to do ruqya on themselves and their families, inshallah. Say inshallah. Inshallah. Bismillah. Um, <coughs> The first thing I think uh, which is very important is uh, Sheikh mentioned about the reality of the jinn. He, he mentioned about the reality of the magic and uh, uh, that is very, very important to understand as a basic. It is important to understand because it dispels the fear because when you don't know what is causing what, what is the cause, and you're just looking at the effect of it, generally it causes fear that why is it happening, what is, or who's doing all of these things. So what I want to do is spend a few minutes going over, inshallah, in uh, trying to understand the types of different types of magic, what people do, right? It is two different things to say, I am learning magic, which is haram. I'm learning about magic to understand some of the things that the sahara, the people who do magic, they do, why they do it and how they do it. And it is important because if you happen to be with somebody who is afflicted, or somebody who asks you to do certain things, you're able to identify and distinguish between the right and the wrong. At the same time, if you see that I am, or somebody who I know is exhibiting those symptoms, you may be able to identify that, you know, what is the right procedure to cure it. So inshallah, that's one part of the, the, the thing, inshallah, that I'll cover. And then the second is the method to do ruqya. That what is the right way to do ruqya? So in the light of sunnah, inshallah, and uh, how Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has taught us. And more importantly, I want to spend some time also in all of the other khurafat, yani the innovations that have come over time. Uh, and even the, even the members of our, I should say, larger community, Muslimin, have inherited from other places. And now, in the name of ruqya, they say this is, this is something to cure, this is something to protect. But in fact, it ends up causing more harm. Okay? So, uh, let's, uh, let's start with that, inshallah. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. So the first thing is the, the type of the type of the sihr. What is mentioned in the Quran to us, the sihr that was done by Labid bin Asim to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was it comes in Surah Falaq, Min Shar al Nafathati fil Uqad. Uqad is to tie knots. Right? There were eleven knots tied, so the sahirin what they do is they tie knots and they blow on them. The tie knots and they blow on them. So oftentimes, uh, you get, uh, I got a case uh, recently, I should say some time back, where somebody had <coughs> severe headache, constant headache. They, was, uh, they, they went to see the doctors, they had constant headaches, and physically, this woman would had, on the left side of her face was a red eye always, and they happened to find an amulet, and that amulet was hidden in, in her scarf somewhere in her cupboard. So when you open it up, you would see the sihr done with the numbers and in, in, in the knots, right? So that somebody would have caused knots. And if you see something, sometimes people, actually you will see also that sometimes people do knots on their motorcycles and their cars for protection. They think that is protection. So that is, uh, that is the type of a sihr that is through uqad. Right? 
Uh, the second type of sihr is right upon. Sometimes when you have incantations, muharramat, so people will write, recite certain things that are of shirkiyah, right? That could be of uh, something that, it will, uh, that is invoking the shayateen, invoking the jinn and such. So that is, uh, that is something. Uh, that's one way to do it as well. The third is smoke. People use smoke. It could be good smell, could be bad smell, it doesn't matter. Generally, people recite certain incantations on it, which are uh, shirki again, and that is the other way to do it. The fourth is madfun. Madfun, sometimes when the people do the sihir in the buried, they bury it into the qubur, they bury it into different makin. Could be the household, could be wherever that point is, that but it is considered as one of the sihir. Now, uh, there are other types of sihr also, which are, for example, marshush, which is sprayed upon. Sometimes people spray on to the entrances of the people's household or items or what have you, and that's another type of sihr. Uh, Sheikh also mentioned about one of the sihr of sihr of illusion, and it's takhayyil. It creates thoughts that you envision something which is not there. You envision somebody as ugly something, for example, right? Your spouse or your children or what have you, they will start looking to you somewhat different. You start having negative feelings towards them, so there's an illusion that is created in your mind, but in reality, it is not that, right? Uh, the last one, which is written, uh, in, uh, and I say last one, there is multiple different ways of doing it, and uh, the fatwa of Sheikh bin Baz on this is the, we are not supposed to even I and mean, we're not supposed to even put an eye to learn this knowledge. Because when Allah has not put benefit into this, there's no benefit in it for us. But uh, sometimes, and the reason I mention some of these uh, is uh, we hear from the people from our own community. They go to people and they describe that this and this and this was given to them and this is the experience uh, they had with certain people who in the name of cure, they actually, instead of curing them, they actually created magic on them, right? So uh, again, these are essentially cautionary statements in the sense that when you see somebody asking you to do certain things, when you see somebody describing to you that they have gone through these experiences, stay away from these experiences because they can be part of the sihr. Uh, two more, I want to conclude with that. And uh, again, there are too many different types that we don't know of, but generally ulama have kind of just brought them into different categories, and some say there are three types, and then some say there are eight types. There could be many more. Allahu A'la is so up there. Uh, two others, one is written. Generally, you find these written sihrs and talasims. So people who are wearing amulets, uh, according to them, this is for protection, for some type of worldly gains, for their businesses to work, for somebody to have children, and somebody to have whatever, and jobs. Uh, I brought some and I will show it to you what is really in them and uh, that's, uh, that's one thing that uh, and generally when you ask people that you know this is haram and this is shirk they will tell you that uh, there is Quran in it there is Quran in it and so there is nothing wrong with it but generally when you open up it I have opened up many and I will tell you from experience that majority of them have uh, something which is maybe a couple of verses of Quran but other things mixed with it so you will see the name of Allah, you will see the name of angels, you will see uh, so the certain verses of the Quran, but there are other things that are uncomprehensible. And I'll show you examples of those, inshallah, as well. Right. Um, the last one I'll cover, inshallah, is eating or drinking. So somebody, when he was doing magic, they will generally feed somebody with their food, and the person gets sick or gets bewitched. Those, these are generally some of the ones uh, uh, that I think uh, should benefit in, in terms of you knowing this. So what are the symptoms? So what, when somebody is bewitched, what are the symptoms of it? Uh, I have few that I've collected. Now, there is no one symptom. So I want to caution you over here that don't go self-diagnosing yourself to say, look, I got this one, right? <laughs> and I am bewitched. So uh, I'll say from experience that after looking at so many cases even, when generally people, there are sometimes people fill out the form and they say, I have every symptom literally on the form. And uh, when you do the ruqya, there's nothing that at least I can diagnose, but there's somebody who came with them who thought there was nothing wrong with them, they were bewitched. So <laughs> this is ilm al ghaib only Allah knows who has the affliction and who doesn't have the affliction. So when the Quran is recited, 
that is exposed. So there's, uh, there's no saying that somebody can look at somebody and say, oh, you're bewitched. Right? It's very, very hard. It's very hard. There are some telltale signs, and some telltale signs, this is, should be, inshallah, uh, good enough for you to, to diagnose yourself and understand if some of these things are, you're going through some of these things. And again, some of these, the, one of the other cautionary statements is that some of these things have to do with medical. I'm not a doctor, so I would still say whenever somebody comes to me, I would say, ask them the question, is there a medical diagnosis first? Is there something that has been concluded or conclusively diagnosed that you are suffering through something and the doctor has a cure for it, right? So number one, uh, turning away from acts of worship and disobedience. Now this can be general as well, but you see this in, uh, in some cases where the person has been praying all the time, person has been doing all the right deeds and suddenly he turns away from being uh, from uh, from being uh, from being uh, performing the salah and from uh, from doing the good deeds. The second is erratic behavior in one's words or deeds and movement. The third is seizures. Now this is a broad category itself, right? So there's a lot of types that when you have a genuine cause for the seizures to happen in the person. But what I'm talking about is seizures with no medical cause. There's no family history. There's no trauma. There's no so there's no damage to the brain or any part of the body, but the person is experiencing seizures. And these seizures happen without any cause, right? Sometimes a person stands in salah and he's unable to, he loses consciences, he or she loses consciences. So that is one part of it, right? So uh, there are signs that indicate that the seizure has devilish causes. So this is not every seizure, uh, but there's a type of seizure there. Paralysis of a limb. So you have a part of the body that is getting numb or paralyzed there's no, again, there's no medical cause to it, but you see that either it starts vibrating or starts, uh, and it starts getting numb, especially when the ruqya has been recited. You see the people, uh, people will tell you that, look, I have a feeling in my body that it's getting numb or I'm unable to feel or there are different sensations that happen. Quick to get angry, uh, weep with no apparent cause. So when the ruqya is recited, you will see people, <clears throat> hysterically laughing, or uncontrollably laughing, or getting angry, or using obscene language, um, or obscene, uh, you know, words as such. But generally, generally, this person has loses his control, uh, anger, very fast, and part of this is also exhibited during the, the ruqya. Uh, constant headache, as I gave you one example, constant, constant headache, one or both sides of the head, no medical cause again, and, and this is something that people take generally a lot of medication, but it does not help them at all. Right? They have to take extreme amount of numbing medication and, uh, for, for that to go, but they are, what I've observed is generally these are the patients who are on more than five or ten different type of pills, and uh, still, it's, as, as soon as they get away from the pill, it's still, it causes, it, uh, it gets, uh, it let, the pain comes back up again. Um, infertility, uh, this, is, this is again with no medical issues, but this is a type of sihr which is called rabt al-arham. So sometimes the sahir or the magician will cause a sihir in such a way that without apparent cause between the husband and wife, they're, they're trying to have children, but there is just no success in it. Whether it is the cause could be the problem could be with the husband or problem could be with the wife as well. But uh, uh, this is one of, the, one of the symptoms there. Repeated unsuccessful attempts in getting married. Uh, distress and intimacy. These are some of the, some of the other... Once essentially, the net of this would be that if, if there is sihr al tafarruq, if the shaitan is causing it, as it's mentioned in the Quran, in, in so words number one or two, it, it is going to cause the tafarruq between the husband and wife, right? And it's to be taken not only from these two relations, but any other relation. So when the Sheikh mentioned about, uh, and I do 100% agree that, you know, generally people come in and say, I know who did it, <laughs> and it is my mother in law. I will say there are people who come in with that conviction. That's very true, with, and and sometimes even the business partner, and sometimes with other. I tell them, what evidence do you have? Because you have to understand, there is another plot of the shaitan in this, which is qata arham. It causes you to think that your uncle did it, your aunt did it, your family member did it, or somebody did something. But what it ends up doing is that when it gives you the thought in your mind, because the jinns generally lie. And when it gives you the thought that, all right, so-and-so did it, are you going to think in the same manner about that person? No. 
So what you end up doing, you have, because you feel that enmity towards that person is going to cause you to cause hatred towards that person and you're going to destroy your relationship, which Allah has asked you to honor that, right? So there's something to be careful of. If, uh, and say, Allah, is it going to help you to know who did whatever versus to ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for cure versus trying to find out who did what, right? So that's something to be careful of there. Uh, physical sicknesses which medicine is unable to treat and for which there is no medical causes, right? Where there are cases that are in ICU where there is no conclusive diagnosis. There's one thing or the other. The doctor says this is happening and that's happening, but they say, well, we don't have evidence to it and the patient is still continuing to suffer through, but there's no cause identified for that person. Hallucinations, a person who is uh, going through sometimes the tkhayyil, they hallucinate, they see certain things, they see certain objects, they see shadows, they, see, they hear voices. Some of those, uh, the, some of those uh, are also the symptoms of a person being affected. Tafarruq is staring up hatred between people, and I say hatred between people, not necessarily limited to husband and wife, but also could be other relationships between friends, between brothers, between siblings, between, any, between business partners. So if somebody, let's say, causes sihr, has enmity towards somebody's business or something, and it causes sihr, and, and there is a person loses, uh, it starts losing his customers, what have you, these are certain, the, some of the symptoms also. Uh, but again, keep in mind what the Sheikh said, look, if you, are bus if you don't know how to run a business, there's something genuinely wrong there, you've got to fix that problem first. <laughs> All right. Um, <clears throat> last two, sexual problems, uh, they're general, general sexual problems, and this again goes back to causing enmity or causing difference between husband and wife, right? Whatever that is essential for the marriage to work, and you will see those components, there's somebody having a problem with that, for, which will become the cause or the reason for the marriage to fail. So these are some of the things, I mean, there are, we can go, keep on going and every patient is different. There's, again, as I said, there's no one or the other cause. But Sheikh also mentioned very, one important one that I generally ask the patient first question is, what kind of dreams are you having? Right. And among the dreams, some of the common ones or the common symptoms that I see uh, first thing is these are dreams of nature that are, which you call categorize them as nightmares, right? People will see themselves falling, flying among the, uh, in the filth, or people will generally have, and I say generally, these are dreams not once in a while, but these are dreams that are continual. The, you will, it's not something that say, if you ask somebody and say, I don't remember, they will remember it because they are either seeing multiple times in a week, or they have continuously seen this, some themselves in the field, themselves being dead, or themselves being chased by animals, dogs, or snakes, or scorpions, or ants, and these kind of the nature, uh, and goes on. And then also, there's uh, dreams that are where they see, uh, there are lustful dreams, whether them being lustful or somebody, somebody else attacking them of that nature. So these are the types of the, the dream as well. Sheikh, you want to add anything to this? Any other symptoms? Okay, inshallah. Uh, animals attacking, uh, I covered dogs or ants or scorpions and some of these, and generally black dogs uh, and, and snakes and those, and those types, right? So there's no limit there, but these are, again, every patient that comes in which has different symptoms, and, uh, as, uh, as, but I'm giving you certain things that are commonly observed and commonly uh, understood by the people who are practicing in this field. So inshallah, with that, I'm going to pivot a little bit to, uh, to, to the Ruqya area. I have uh, about 10, 15 minutes left, inshallah. All right, inshallah. So first thing is on the Ruqya, first of all, you have to wish that you don't ever meet your enemy, and inshallah, Allah protect us all that we never suffer through this, this kind of sickness. So the best thing before we say that we are going to treat is that how do we pre prevent and protect? Very, very important, right? Don't wait for it to happen, and don't say that, look, uh, we are far away, and the magicians are not over here in this country. I googled it before coming over here, just in DFW area. About 50 just in DFW area. So there are people around us. And these are the same people, doesn't matter, as, as Sheikh said, it was, it's not just in uh, back east culture or so. 
These are the witches that were made to, they were burned and they were expelled from the communities and societies. Now these are the same people who have offices and psychic offices and palm reading and horoscope and other things in our community. And you can Google it yourself, you will see around 30, 40 in just DFW area. And not to say that people summon these or buy these services abroad as well. So people, one can be afflicted if somebody has any evil thoughts, any evil intention. So best thing, number one, is uh, prevent and protect. So I'll go through very simple things that we can do. First of all, how can you prevent yourself from these sicknesses? Number one, seek refuge with the supplication of Prophet Ibrahim. Peace be upon him. Narrated, uh, this is the hadith narrated by Abbas. The Prophet وسلم, used to seek refuge with Allah uh, for Hassan and Hussein and say, your forefather, that is Ibrahim السلام, used to seek refuge with Allah for Ismail and Ishaq by reciting the following. Oh Allah, I seek refuge with your perfect words from every devil and from poisonous pests and from every evil, harmful and uh, envious eyes. This is, أعوذ بكلمات الله التامة من كل شيطان وهامة من كل عين اللامة. Right? Second, أذكار. Recite every morning and every evening. This is, whoever recites three times every morning and every evening, this is, بسم الله الذي لا يضر مع اسمه شيء في الأرض ولا في السماء وهو السميع العليم. This is narrated by Tirmidhi. And inshallah, nothing will harm him. The third, this is very evident, the, the way Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam's ruqya was done by Jibreel alayhi wa sallam, which is, ma'awi the thing, falaq and nas. Right, they recite Surah Ikhlas, Surah Falaq, at three times, morning and evening. Wallahi, this is, uh, almost every masjid, this is, there is something, ha there is a, there's a pamphlet hanging, adhkar ba'd al-salah. How many of you do it? Inshallah. How many of you are going to do it after this? Inshallah. Wallahi, <laughs> both hands. <laughs> Every one of you almost will have an adhkar app in your cell phone. Which that adhan app has adhkar in it. All you have to do is make a routine. Look, if you're seeking protection, you have, two, you have only two options. One, to fear somebody is going to do something to you. Or you seek protection from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I'll tell you, that when I was studying Ruqya, the first chapter of it was, how does the Raqi protect himself? And I'm not kidding you. It was Fatiha, Ayatul Kursi, Falaq al Nas. There's no special recipe. This is the recipe. This is the special recipe. So if you're seeking, after every salah, you're seeking protection from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I'm not talking about cure, I'm talking about protection before it happens. You have nothing to worry, right? So, Adhkar al Sabah, Adhkar al Musah, Allah says in the Quran, Fasabihu qabla tulu'i shamsi wa qabla al ghurub. Sit down after Salat al Fajr. Sit down, Gabla Salat al Maghrib. Sit down and do your adhkar. It'll take 10-15 minutes, inshallah. Okay? So these are very simple things that one can follow through, inshallah, in their routine. And uh, they should be able to. Uh, you should be able to get this in your, uh, in your, in your routine. Okay. Jazakallah khair. So last part is the treatment of ruqya. Let's assume for a second that you are afflicted or you want to do ruqya on yourself or on your family. All right, how are you going to do it? First of all, there is a ruqya, ruqya has, there's ruqyas of two types, okay? Ruqyas of two types. One is ruqya shari'iya, which is permissible, and ruqya shirkiya, everything else. So let's talk about what is shari'iya first. Seeking assistance from Allah alone. The treatment starts by you placing the trust in Allah first. That's it, Allah alone. That is the start of the treatment. Not on raqi. Not on something else, not on a tree or a stick or an object or a stone or a ring, not on ta'weev, nothing. Nothing at all. This is, first of all, it's fixing the aqeedah, right? And, and then, understand when Allah says in the Quran, وَنُنَزِّلُ مِنَ الْقُرْآنِ مَا هُوَ شِفَاءٌ وَرَحْمَةٌ لِلْمُؤْمِنِينَ That Allah has put shifa in the Quran, right? And there's... In, 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 in the Ruqya, there are, couple, there are a couple of different parts to it. One is seeking refuge in Allah, His remembrance and supplication that are used as the means of treating the sick, a sick a sickness and other problems as the, as the Quran is a source of healing, as I mentioned in the previous verse. All right? Uh, those brothers or sisters who are going to receive the bottle of water, 
We ask you to keep it with you. Don't open it right now, inshallah. We are going to let you know when to do that. So, uh, how is the ruqya to be done? Inshallah, we'll do a quick practical. So this way, everybody learns, inshallah, how to do the ruqya. But ruqya, shari'iya, is done with the verses of the Quran. Okay. So if you find Husn al-Muslim or any other books that has ruqya, you'll find ruqya is very, very simple. You can make an intention. May Allah, I'm making the intention of ruqya, or intention of cure, or shifa. May Allah give me the cure. And say Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. There are numerous incidences before I cannot get into the details. But Al-Fatiha. Everybody knows Al-Fatiha. You can recite Al-Fatiha. Ayat Al-Kursi. Last two verses of Al-Baqarah. Mu'awwidha thing. Five things. Fatiha. Just remember, five things. If you can do this, five. Fatiha. Ayat Al-Kursi. Last two verses of Al-Baqarah. Falaq al-Nas. Can everybody remember that? That's all. You should, if you know this, and even if you don't know all of it, you don't know, you know Fatiha, or any words of the Quran, because Allah says, وَنُنَزِّلُ مِنَ الْقُرْآنِ Not only Fatiha, not only Mu'awid the thing not only uh, any other words. In the entire Quran can be used as Ruqya. So if you go to a Raqi, if he chooses that he's going to recite this verse or the other words, that's fine. Right? That's fine. But if there, is, or there are certain specific verses for Sihir, there are certain specific verses which have a meaning, uh, associated to it, that if you understand, inshallah, you can recite those. And if you don't know more, then even Fatiha, even Mu'awithathain, I shouldn't say even Mu'awithathain, Mu'awithathain themselves, because this was the Ruqya of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So you know, if you recite, but, and this is what I tell the brothers. There are people who come in and say, I've been doing Ruqya for 15 years and nothing happened. How can that be? You tell me. Something not right in this equation, right? Either the intention was not there correctly, or conviction was in there. So people generally do ruqya when they're driving, when they're walking, when they're about to sleep. Or say, Look, you're asking your creator for assistance. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Give undivided attention. It's quality over quantity. People say, I listen to ruqya three hours a day, 10 hours a day. It's like, what? It's, not, it's not that you have to listen. Who said that you have to listen to three hours for shifa to come? Shifa comes from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, not from the Raqi, not from you doing three hours or five minutes or ten minutes. It's you doing or one sincere dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that you have an opportunity after every salah to do the adhkar for protection. You have an opportunity to do ruqya on yourself and on your families every time. You don't have to go necessarily to a Raqi. Our religion does not allow us to be dependent on somebody other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this is something very, very important for us to keep in mind. Shaykh, you want to go with the practice? Okay. So there is one last piece that I want to cover that's absolutely important before we get into the practical of the ruqya. Uh, things to avoid, absolutely essential. Look, uh, and this is, this is something that has... Time upon time, every time that we see a patient, I ask, and they say, I have gone through to a Raqi, and he, and, and he or she did this and this and this, and I tell them, look, this is not Ruqya. Why I want to share this with you is because on the name of Ruqya, people are causing harm to themselves, or because they do not know what Ruqya is, they end up going to people that end up giving them magic, or other things that harm them versus cure them. So if you cannot get the cure, at least don't get the harm, right? And actually people are paying money to get those things. So which is the worst part of it. So I will cover quickly before we get into the practical, inshallah, I'll take two, three minutes and cover. And these are, you should be able to identify this immediately. If you see some of these things, better not to go this, to this person. Or if you see somebody describing to you that this is how I got my ruqya done or my treatment done, run away, okay? Number one. If somebody says, I am using the help of jinn or muwakkil to treat you, who has the power to cure? Allah. Who is a shafi? Allah. Not the jinn. Okay? Asking the jinn to help identify the cure or the sickness of the patient. Do you believe what the jinn says? No. When the jinn says your mother-in-law did it, would you believe it? No. You don't have to. Okay? Uh, using amulet and talisman. I'll give you an example. 
So we call it ta'weez. This is a patient that came to me on Saturday. This was supposed to be, I'm going to cover one part of it. Do you see anything on this side? And this person has been suffering through more than 10, 15 years of a marriage. And is there anything written in it? Nothing. So people are fooled that they are wearing something that is going to protect them. Wallahi, I opened this up. This was in a leather pouch. There's nothing in it. On the other hand, this is, this is, this is coming from, this is a magic I believe was made in Afghanistan. The entire family had it. The entire family had amulets. So this is a ta'weez. Can you understand what is in there? Scribbles. And people are wearing this on the name of protection. Allah, don't fall for this, guys. Don't fall for this. Okay? Some of this is actually magic. Whenever you see something, scores and numbers and such things, these are, this is immediately, say, this is sihr and get away from it. May Allah protect us all, inshallah. All right? Uh, third, interesting that shifa will come from the raqi. No. Again, this is very important, right? So people start raqi shopping, right? I go into this guy and this guy and this guy, and this is between you and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and your faith and your iman. So this is very important. Fifth, please don't create fitna, blaming or suspecting because this is one number one reason that causes tafarrah. If you didn't have an issue in the family. So Sheikh mentioned one aspect of it that look, if your marriage is not working, don't blame it on the jinn. Don't play victim. But then blaming somebody within the family, so and so did something, is also another fitna. So many families break because of this. People accuse each other that you did something to me. If you, I'll give you, if you even know somebody did something to you, is that, does that person have the power to cure you? No. As-sihru, inna Allah sayubatilu. Not the raqi, not the person, not the magician. Sometimes people go to the magician and say, so and so did this, so it's, it's revenge. We're going to go to the magician and get the same thing done to them. Or to get it cancelled. Allah, this is, this is haram. Going to the magician, as the Sheikh mentioned. Uh, there are other ones that I'm going to uh, skip. There are generally things that uh, are understandable, that are incomprehensible. Look, if, the, if people who are of a strong faith will immediately understand if somebody is causing them to do any kind of shirk or any kind of uh, negative things or using things that are muharram, haram for ilaj. Look, as long as the thing is, Allah has put shifa in certain things, if we know it, as the Sheikh mentioned, we know it, we can take benefit from it. If you don't know it, then you can ask somebody who has knowledge of it. So using honey, using habba, using habba sauda, using sidr, using sinna, all of this, and anything that is halal, it's permissible in the ilaj. If the raqi uses some of these things, or you read the hadith, and it's alaykum bis sinna, or sunnut, or in sidr, all of this is, is jayz in the treatment, including the recitation of the Quran. If somebody recites something on the water, something, somebody recites on the honey and olive oil to, to use it, this is all permissible. But if somebody says, look, bring me the feather of uh, some animal or the skin of something, this is, يعني, this is there is no evidence of it. And this, is, uh, this will fall into the category of a person believing that so and so thing will help them cure as such when there is no evidence from Sunnah there. So one should avoid and not fall into these traps of, uh, of in the, on the name of uh, cure. Sheikh, you want to go? Yes, inshallah. So um, practical, how do you do the ruqya? So Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he used to recite Mu'awwid thain, blow on his hand, so this is a rock part, there's incantation, there is recitation, there is a blowing part. So he would blow on his hands and wipe on his body. Whatever is evident. Now, there's also hadith said by Aisha radiallahu anha when Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa was sick, she would recite on Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and use his hands to wipe his body. Right? So if you are doing ruqya on yourself, imagine, what are you going to do? You make an intention, you recite, as I said, Fatiha, Ayat al-Kursi, last two of Baqarah, 
Ma'awidhatayn. Blow on your hands and wipe on your body. That's one way to do it. Right? You can do the same thing with Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam did for Hassan and Hussein. أعوذ بكلمات الله التامة من كل شيطان وهامة ومن كل عين اللامة. Right? Not put a ta'weez on them, but put them under the protection of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that's the way to do it. Do they have? Sheikh is asking, do they have to have wudu to do that? Uh, Sheikh, I have not read that you have to have necessarily wudu. All right, um, there's other ways. So for example, there are people who do not know how to recite Quran. Or there are other ways that you can also benefit from the ruqya. How would you do? So you have water bottles? Open up your water bottles. Let's do this together, inshallah, okay? So one way to do this is that generally people think, look, ruqya is only for people who are sick. I told you earlier that it was used for protection also. So you can do it proactively. You don't have to say, look, unless I'm sick, I'm not going to do it. The Quran, Allah says in the Quran, wa nunazilu min al-Qur'ani ma huwa? Shifa. So is the Quran going to cause any harm? No. People are scared. It's like, oh, I'm not sick, so is something going to happen to me if I do ruqya? Wallahi, the Quran is only going to benefit the believer. It was only going to benefit the believer. So there is nothing to be scared in that category, right? So. There are a couple of things that, uh, look, the shifa, word shifa is mentioned about six times in the Quran, right? One of them is for honey as well, right? Allah has mentioned about uh, of, of the benefits of, of uh, olive oil as well, zayt, zay, or zaytun. All of this is, has benefit and they are used as part of the treatment plan. So one can do very easily, when I told you about how you do it on the body, the second way you could do it is that you could do ruqya on the water, you could recite the ruqya on the water, blow on it, and anybody in the house, anybody can consume it. Right? So there was a question that was asked to my sheikh of some people who do not believe in ruqya, some people who are perhaps may not be able to recite. Is there a way we can get them the benefit of the ruqya? Right? How, can we, how can we give them something that will benefit them? And this is one of the ways as well. Right? You, can, you can benefit your entire family if you have Ruqya water in the house and everybody is drinking from it. That's one way to do it. Sometimes it's very hard to convince people because the wife thinks that the husband is afflicted. The husband says, no, I'm not afflicted. I'm not getting the Ruqya done. How do you get the Ruqya done? How do you pass on the benefit, right? I'm not saying that's the, that you should do it, but there's no harm. There's no harm in this. And there's only benefit in the Quran. So let's take out the bottles. Let's take out the bottle, open the legs. So how I advise my patients to, to do the ruqya on the water or in the honey or on the olive oil. This is something that each one of you can do at home and, uh, and you, can, you can pass it on to, to anybody who that you want to benefit to. So you bring the bottle close to you, to your mouth, and I say, A'udhu billahi minash shaitan ar-rajim, bismillah ar-rahman ar-rahim, alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen, ar-rahman ar-rahim, maliki yawm ad And then after a few verses, you do dry spittle. Nafq, right? You drew dry spittle on the water. Similarly, Maliki Umiddin, Iyaka Na'budu wa Iyaka Nasta'een, Ihdina Surat al Mustaqim, Surat al Ladina and Amta Alayhim, Rayr al Mardubi Alayhim, Walad Dalin. Amen. Right? The water is Makru. Do you need a Raqi to do this? Can you do it yourself? Khalas. This is it. You don't need a Sheikh to do this. Wallahi. <laughs> you, could, you could do this yourself, inshallah, right? And uh, similarly, is it limited to what I just told you that you only, these are the things that need to be recited? No. Can you recite more? Can I recite Baqarah? Yes, of course you can recite more. Can I recite multiple times? Of course you can recite multiple times, right? There is no limit. There is no condition on this. The more you know, the more you can recite, inshallah, right? So now, what can you do with this water? Is it just for you? Anyone, there's no limit, all right? Anybody can consume it. You can drink it, you can bathe with it, you can, you can give it to somebody else to benefit from it, inshallah. Can we add it to a bigger quantity of water? Uh, Sheikh's asking, can we add it to a bigger quantity of water? Yes, you can. Yes, you can. Generally, uh, if you have this, let's say you have one bottle made and you want to add it to the jug or a drum in the house which has other, you know, more water in there, you can generally do that as well, right? The same can be done to olive oil, the same can be done to, uh, to the honey uh, also 
for consumption. In fact, to the point that uh, Sheikh has, uh, my Sheikh has an opinion that even if you are consuming dawa, let's say it's an ointment or so, and you know this is, this is the right treatment for your sickness and ailment, you can recite ruqya on it and consume it. It's only going to benefit you. Right? So you, it's not that you are doing only this treatment or that treatment. You can do dawa and you can recite ruqya on the dawa because Allah is the one who is the shafi, not the dawa. Right? So this is something that you can do on the dawa itself, inshallah. Jazakallah khair. That's all I have. Jazakallah khair. Barakallah fikum, Brother Buzaid Talha, for this beautiful presentation. I believe you have a website as well, right? Or what's it called? Ruqya service. Ruqya services or service or services? Service. Rukkaservice.com for those who would like to contact Brother Abu Zaid, inshallah, you can do that. Now we would like to uh, uh, give you a chance for Q&A. But one thing I want to mention as a remark, inshallah, in conclusion for what we heard from Sheikh Yasser regard to the subject of sihr, even though the jinn are powerful and strong and so forth, and also we have seen, we heard the protection, it's in a simple way using the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You know, how powerful this jinn might be in our imagination, our concept, uh, perception of them, how weak they can be before the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah Azza wa Jalla says, فَقَاتِلُ أَوْلِيَاءَ الشَّيْطَانِ إِنَّ كَيْدَ الشَّيْطَانِ كَانَ ضَعِيفًا He said, indeed, the kaid of the shaytan, which means the plotting of the shaytan, is always weak. No matter how powerful you think that shaytan, that jinn is, when it comes to the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the shaytan is always weak. And just like we sometimes fear them because we cannot see them, they also fear the believers. They fear the believers because they know they are protected and guarded by the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, by the words of Allah azza wa and the dua from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to Allah azza wa jal. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us all protection, ya Rabbil Alameen. Protect our families, our children. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to purify our hearts, our lives, our souls, to purify our homes and our household from any evil of the shayateen, ya Rabbil Alameen. So with that being said, inshallah, we start with a few questions, bin Allah ta'ala. Yes. Go ahead. The question is, what is the original or natural form of the jinn, and what is the language that they uh, speak? Alhamdulillah, I've never seen a jinn. <laughs> Even though I've interacted with many of them, but no jinn story study, don't worry. Uh, but I have never seen a jinn, and I don't want to see a jinn. I ask Allah's refuge from that. But what we can gather, and this is an ijtihadi issue, this is an ijtihadi issue. There's no qat'i stuff in the Quran and Sunnah. What we can gather, ma'qul and tajriba, the jinn do not have what you would call an original structure. The notion of original structure is based on three dimensions. It's based on flesh and blood. It's based on material matter. Energy does not have an original structure. And that is why the jinn can appear in different forms because energy can, it, they, are, they are, the term is shape shifters in the common vernacular, they can take on any shape. One thing that is observed and videotaped and recorded a lot is orbs of light. And many, you know, shows and cameras, even YouTube, I'm not asking you to do that but if you do want to be as recite Fatiha before you, but before you do this, because it's not a joke. I, that's why uh, a lot of people want to hear jinn stories and whatnot. It's not a joke. You are, you, are, you are entering this world even by these talks. So you have to be careful. But one of the things that is mentioned is orbs of light. That it's very common. Security cameras find them and you actually have, there's many genres about this. I've also interacted with people that have sihr done on them and they have videotaped in their house light, orbs of light going like this, you know, like that. But even this, is it quote-unquote original? I mean, what is the notion of original? We have an original form because we are matter. They are not matter in the first place. So Allah knows best. It is my ijtihad. There is no such thing as an original form for the jinn. They can take on forms and they take on forms that terrify us. So that is why this, this common genre of horror movies and the, we are terrified by these shapes of werewolves and whatnot. So they terrify us taking on these shapes. As for the languages of the jinn, there is no doubt they do have languages that they speak. But they communicate with us in our languages. We do not learn their languages. Our languages are superior to theirs. So you have jinns that are 
following our religions and speaking our languages. You have Muslim jinn, Buddhist jinn, Hindu jinn, Christian jinn. They follow our religions. And you also have the jinn that speak our languages. They speak Urdu, English, Arabic, Pashtun, whatever the languages are, they will speak them if they're in that culture and they're living in that culture. They have their own languages, which it appears that some of the Sahara are communicating in that language, right? So this is something that the jinn are teaching them to communicate in. But we men do not speak their languages as a culture. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. Is there any question from the sister side? Yes, from the sister here. How do, if you see the orbs of lights, how do you protect yourself or anything like that? If you see the jinn. <coughs> So if uh, the first thing I would do is recite Ayat al-Kursi, simple as that. Look, this is seeking protection from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. As I said, be proactive in that. You don't want to face your enemy, number one. If you happen to see it in your house, the right way would be that you recite Surah Al-Baqarah in the house regularly so the shayateen would not exist in your house. So that's the right answer to it. Uh, we have a, a question come here actually in, in, in writing form. Do magicians uh, uh, use uh, sigils representing the moon, uh, sun, or pyramids to perform magic? Uh, the question is, do magicians use sigils, S-I-J-G-I-L-S, which is a term that means f specific uh, characters and forms, uh, to perform magic? This is one of the madhabs of sihr. As we said, sihr has different madhabs. Uh, and of them is the, the knotting, of them is the sigils, of them is the square boxes with numbers and numerology, of them is voodoo. These are all mechanisms of how mankind is communicating. Of them is to draw things on the ground, you know, the pentagons and circles and sit in them and invoke. These are all mechanisms or madhabs of how to communicate what you want to the jinn. So this is one of them and Allah knows best. Yes, go ahead. It has nothing to do with Jinn and Sihar right now. It's us. So the question is basically about Halloween right now. We were trying to avoid this question about Halloween because we've discussed that multiple times and many, many times. You go to, uh, to work, you go to the doctor's office, some other places they have uh, um, whatever actually a bowl that has uh, shaped with a skull and anything else and has candy in it. So do you eat from that candy or not? The question is, is that candy halal because of this particular uh, uh, event or practice and so forth? Like, would that be haram because they're now given this candy because of that particular uh, occasion? Our person say, you don't have to eat it. There's no obligation to eat that, so just don't eat it. And even if they offer you, so just say thank you very much. Just to still be on the safe side. It's still candy though. No. Oh, bismillah. Someone's passionate about this question. Go for it. Could you repeat the question again, please? <laughs> okay, so that's yours. So the question is best to repeat the question. If you learn magic by mistake, you're hanging out with the wrong crowd, uh, you went to a Halloween party, it ended up being, you know, black magic party. <laughs> so what do you do then? So, uh, it's actually a very good question. I'll tell you in the spirit of the, uh, the event of Halloween. How many of you know this Ouija game? You know it? You know what is in there? Have you ever opened the board and see the amulet inside it? You don't know? Look, uh, there is one part to say, look, you are going to a magician, or somebody is intentionally causing you harm. That's one part. Right? That's, that's understandable. You should definitely not go to the magicians. Or if you now happen to know and you are able to identify some of the symptoms discussed, stay away. That's number one. Take precaution. Second is that there are people who knowingly or unknowingly or accidentally involve themselves into an area that will become the cause for their possession. A shahawat, their desires. Going intentionally watching a horror movie. Getting yourself scared. Uh, asking or doing some crazy incantations and I mean there's num numerous things Pe just 
doesn't make any logical sense. People running in the graveyard at night, just for the fun of it. I mean, uh, uh, there's no, this all nonsense. So if you are exposing yourself, so and uh, you will, uh, and in fact, not only this, if you're, this is not limited to your physics, but it is also to your faculties, right? It's how you're using your eyes, your ears, your mouth, it's all, it all it plays a part. So, uh, for example, sometimes some lyrics of the songs have invitations to things that you should not be inviting to, or sending invitations to. And uh, you could say, look, is it accidental? And so Allah has given us the, all the faculties to do with dhikr, and then we have to protect each one of them. So I want to add to that because I have dealt with a number of cases in my own life, and I don't do them anymore, but when I used to, number of cases where people have accidentally, act, meaning, what I mean accidentally, they did not intend to actually call out to the jinn, but they're playing the Ouija board, for example, right? They think it's fun. Or they will just do a spell for the heck of it. So it's not accidental in the sense you don't just walk into a magic spell, right? But, you know, there was a case I did where a, a, a teenager, uh, usually there are teenagers, they, they don't understand the repercussions of what they're doing. They're just for the heck of it. They download a spell and they follow it and they draw the pentagram and they sit in it and they call out and whatnot. I mean, you are playing with a demon. It's not a joke. You are invoking a powerful entity, far more powerful than you. Imagine if you could walk into the office of the mafia and say, here, have a thousand dollars, can you do something for me, right? Whether you're 10 years old or 50, if you have the thousand, if you do what they're wanting you to do, you are getting into that dunya, right? So do not take this as a trivial matter. These types of tarot cards and Ouija boards and, and, and performing the incantations and, and what? I have a different position than you in this, but so let's not get into this, okay? I know what I say and I know what I'm not saying. Uh, and so, uh, you know, uh, there are things that are not inherently dangerous if you have a background, and there are things that are dangerous if you're jahid, right? So I'm mentioning specifically tarot cards, Ouija boards, doing things that are literally invoking the entity, drawing diagrams and sitting in them. SubhanAllah, are you out of your mind? Do you understand what you're doing? You are sending a signal to the jinn world, come to me, come to me. When they come to you, don't criticize anyone but yourself. It's not a joke here. Sister so, Saad, so, do we have any question here? Okay, go ahead. Assalamu alaikum. Hmm. My question is, say like you don't like have any enemies and nobody's really out to get you, you haven't harmed anyone, is there any reason for a jinn to like harm you on their own accord? And if so, like what are the situations where a jinn, a jinn would want to come after you on their own accord? <laughs> Sheikh, I'll take their advice. Um, you're asking, sister, if there is a reason for the jinn to come after you. Uh, I, I think I explained before that, uh, of course, uh, other than magic, uh, let's understand, let's keep it very simple to the point that we have desires. Humans have desires, and jinns have desires. If somebody makes an, a desire to hurt somebody, there's no other reason required other than that, just, just to keep it simple. And, uh, and they choose you as, as an opponent that, look, I'm going to go after and have an enmity with this person or because uh, whatever reason, maybe. Jinns are jinn and as humans have desires. Look, I like something of yours. I need it. All right. Uh, I'm going to put up a fight for it. And that's, that's how jinns can be. So I'll just limit it to that because it, the, the definition or the details can be much more and I don't want to get into that. Let's take a share's advice. Uh, another question we have here. What does Nazar mean? Is it, does it fall under the Sahar or anything like that? And if there's any cure to it, so anything? You want to take that one as well? It's part of the Sahar. So uh, we in Urdu say Nazar, in Arabic it's Ayn. And our Prophet ﷺ said, Al Ainu Haq. This is a very simple hadith, it's two words, Abu Dawood. Al Ainu Haq. Ayn, Nazar, is Haq. It's an authentic hadith. We believe in it, and it's mentioned in the Quran, right? Right? Uh, and also, uh, this phrase here also is Ain in the Quran. So Ain is true. However, Ain is a separate 
category, it is not sihr. It is a sin, it is evil, but it is not sihr. It emanates from a heart full of jealousy. So the, what, there are a number of differences between ayn and sihr. The main one is that the one who gives ayn, the one who gives nazar, he is not drawing on a pentagram or calling out to the demons by name. Rather, he is allowing jealousy to grow in his heart. And that's haram. And that jealousy through a mechanism that we're not going to go into right now, but that's the whole point. How it happens is a controversy and whatnot. But that jealousy, that ayn, that nazar, it causes harm in the object of jealousy. Okay? Whether the jinn are involved or not, we were just talking about this before and that's a more advanced topic, but that's not sihr per se. But it shares with sihr some issues. And of them, the cure is through ruqya. The same ruqya that cures sihr will cure ayn. However, by experience, certain verses are more powerful for ayn and certain verses are more powerful for sihr. But falaq and nas are the most powerful for both. We'll leave it at that, inshallah. For so, uh, for the sake of time, we want to finish as quick as possible, inshallah. Two questions right away for you. Uh, can, uh, can we wear stones for, uh, for good luck or for protection? You know, specifically this, uh, the blue thing and uh, so whatever. The simple answer is no. no. I, I was coming from the airport just about a week and a half back and somebody had that blue stone with the shape of an eye. Uh, the Uber driver had it hanging right, right next to his, uh, the rear view mirror. So I couldn't just help asking, it's like, why, why are you hanging this? I mean, this is, could be an obstacle between you and getting a good view. I said, somebody gave it to me for good luck or protection. <laughs> and you could, yeah, actually, that stone, Sheikh, is also there next to the registers in the Muslim stores, no, and uh, into the kitchens, into the businesses. Apparently, the intention is what? That the ayn is going to come in and get absorbed <laughs> over there, or you're going to have protection. That is not the way to, to seek protection. Sheikh, people are also asking, uh, uh, lots of YouTube ruqyas are available. Uh, are we okay to play this uh, uh, at home for protection? Does it have the same effect? So, uh, first of all, there's no restriction on playing ruqya. There is no restriction. You can play, but afdal. Afdal is what? A dhikr. You recite from your tongue. You want to compensate by listening to a sheikh's recorded ruqya, you can listen to it. There's no harm. There's benefit in there, inshallah. So, last question from the, from the brother's side and one from the sister's side, inshallah. Somebody didn't ask a question before. Go ahead. So, I'm going to repeat the question. Uh, do psychics have access to the jinn and can the jinn see the future? As uh, the hadith mentions, firstly, No one knows ghayb except Allah Azza wa Jal. Right? And Allah says, No one knows what is going to happen tomorrow, not even the prophets of Allah or the angels. No one knows the future. Secondly, the majority of what we call psychics and whatnot, the majority of them are simple frauds. They're just basically con artists. They're not even doing anything with any world. They're just basically fleecing you for your money. Uh, however, there is a category amongst them, small category, that is involved in dabbling in actual sihr and magic. So, Tarots and astrology and predicting the stars and looking at your, your palmistry and all of this, this is a branch of sihr. Our Prophet wasallam said that astrology is a branch of sihr. The more you get involved in astrology, the more you get involved in sihr. So some of these people are invoking the jinn or they have a connection with the jinn world and the only way the jinn might say the future is mentioned in the hadith in Sahih Muslim and others that the Prophet says the angels are speaking amongst themselves about the qadr of Allah that he has told them that so and so is going to die this year. So they mention amongst themselves that they're giving the task out. So a jinn is hiding and listening to that conversation. So the jinn hears Allah's qadr being discussed, the future qadr. The jinn has no knowledge other than its hearing. Then the Prophet said it will come down and whisper into the ear of its qareen, meaning its psychic, but add 199 lies. Because he only has one bit of information and nobody wants to pay money for that one bit of information, right? So once in a while, the qareen will 
hit the nail on the head because the jinn has heard this correct fact, but the rest of them are all lies. In our religion, it is haram to go to these people. It is shirk to believe that they know ilm al ghayb and it is something that will nullify actions of worship if we do that, and Allah knows best. Last question, inshallah. Sister, go ahead. So the question is that how can you do ruqya for a family member that is not with you? Yeah, or right. overseas or so, and, and this person cannot recite on themselves? Do, do they have knowledge of the Quran? Okay. So look, there is no restrictions on, uh, on that a person has to be absolutely in physical. Obviously, there, it is preferred that the person who is reciting the ruqya, the other person is in front of the other person because there is a raq and nafq that you recite and you blow. But if the person, you don't have access to it, you can still benefit the person. You can recite it over the phone. There is no issues over with that. Over the phone, FaceTime. So. You can do over the phone or FaceTime. Mm -hmm. the, the people, I mean, the ruqaz, some of the ruqaz may not do it for the reasons because they see the less effectiveness and they want to put their time to the best use or such. But look, there, as I said, number one rule, the Quran will only benefit. If you can benefit one of your brothers, do it. Right? And if that is the way that you can have accessibility to them through phone and you can do it. Nowadays it's easy with that. Go ahead and do it, inshallah. No problem. No. Uh, Jazakumallah khair, uh, Sheikh Yasser, for uh, this beautiful presentation. Brother Abu Zaid as well for being with us uh, this evening. SubhanAllah, myself and, and Brother Abu Zaid, we were talking about having a full day presentation for this. And I want to apologize for the brothers and the sisters who were, we were unable to take your questions. We know there are so many. For hopefully, inshallah, that we can make another presentation, but it's going to be much longer to entertain all these questions, inshallah. Wa wa Jazakumallah khair. Thank you very much. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa ta'ala wa barakatuh. لا يزال الخير حيا لا يزال إن في الدنيا سلاما وظلال أخبر الأيام أنها في وصال قم بنا وانظر لآيات الجمال قم بنا وانظر لآيات الجمال